All right, PS4, it's been five years. It's time to take a look at your report cards. All right, so PlayStation 4 came out November 15th, 2013 in North America. It's been five years this console has been in the market and available to consumers, so I think now's a great time actually to reflect on those five years and basically review the system, grade it. How well has Sony done with the system? How well has the system done over time? And we will actually go over various aspects of the console itself. So actually we'll go over hardware, features, PlayStation Network, games, how Sony has handled these last five years, and just an overall score. And without wasting any time at all, we'll go right into hardware. Sony released the PS4 Slim Revision, which was expected based on the company's history, and the Ultra Slim console serves its purpose well in the marketplace, with a lower price point, lower power consumption, and quieter operation compared to the original model, which was often seen as a bit loud. The big change this time around was PS4 Pro, a mid-cycle update, which sets the stage for how consoles could change and adapt to stay relevant in our ever-evolving landscape of technology. The Pro was initially met with backlash, but in my opinion, honestly, Sony handled this console extremely well. It's still a PS4, but it just gives you extra performance at the same starting price point from a PS4 in 2013. Developers can scale their games depending on which PS4 is being used, and there's no worry about compatibility. I also think that the naming scheme fits perfectly and tells the consumer in the simplest of terms that this is just a better PS4 and it's not a PlayStation 5, which also sets the stage for how PS5 will likely feature backwards compatibility. Given that the Pro and even the Xbox One X are using x86 to make compatibility a non-issue moving forward. Now, PlayStation VR was also introduced and this was a very big deal because this is Sony's first foray into virtual reality. And it's definitely first generation hardware, it's got a good amount of growing pains, but it's been the most accessible premium VR and the games and experiences available today demonstrate the potential that the VR has. Small experiences like Job Simulator and Superhot, they're the gateway drugs to wanting more VR. And then games like Resident Evil 7 and Skyrim, those are your proof of concept that big scale games can work and they can work extremely well. Now moving on to features, Sony initially revealed the PS4 to be heavily focused on the social aspect of the console with things like live streaming and the share button. And the live streaming features, they never really seemed to catch on, but the share button was pretty much a big success. You see photo modes in pretty much every major game now, and you see a lot of clips being shared on YouTube and Twitter. And Sony has added a vast array of these features to extend the social aspect of the console even further. Features like communities, where people can build communities and talk to each other and, and join up in groups. Then you have the ability to follow profiles, and your friends can follow all of your activities very closely. You can comment on your activities. And then there's the share play feature, which is arguably one of the bigger ones, which lets you play remotely from another person's console or watch their gameplay. All of these have heavily enriched the system's social aspect, and they've been widely used across the board. And there's many other quality of life updates that were added, like accessibility options, privacy and friend settings, and a big UI facelift in 2016, adding the much more intuitive quick menus. And in my own controlled test, I found that the latest firmware updates install games exponentially faster, and it appears that they're just more optimized in general. And so now we can get into PlayStation Network, and I feel this is one of Sony's weaker areas, if not the weakest, of the last five years in terms of PS4. It seems as though PlayStation Network has mostly been pretty disappointing on a number of fronts. Starting with PlayStation Plus, it seems like a lot of the games they've been giving out are games that gamers just flat out don't want or they don't enjoy. And this is hard to quantify objectively given gamers' tastes and demands, but look at almost any PS Plus video from Sony's YouTube channel and you'll see the dislike bar is almost always larger. Either the games are deemed not good enough or undesirable or smaller scale titles instead of bigger budget games, but it seems like PlayStation Plus, more often than not, is always giving out games that people don't want. PlayStation Now is likely not making the progress that Sony was hoping for given the company never shares details about how well the service has been performing, but Sony understands its importance and I think that's why they continue to add so many more games and just await that consumer shift to streaming. And they are being very patient. Now for things like PlayStation View and TV and video services, fairly positive. There's been a wide variety of apps and services and they all have pretty competitive pricing and it seems like PlayStation View actually has had some pretty moderate success in various markets. But PlayStation Network maintenance is still a big issue. People pay for the service, and it seems like there's really no discernible difference from now in the PS3 days. You're still seeing many outages and downtime, and it can be very frustrating. PlayStation Network name changes is still an issue. Despite the fact that Sony now has a solution, we are recently learning that this is not totally foolproof, so we finally get this feature we've been asking for for so long within these five years of PS4, and sure enough, it's just not quite what we wanted 
to begin with. And as we leave Sony's worst, we can get into Sony's best, which is the game section. Initially, the games were a little slow off the line, but this is pretty typical with most hardware launches. It was a bit lacking compared to Xbox One at launch, and early on, Sony focused on independent developers. That was really something that they doubled down with. But today, Sony has now built up its library of exclusives, and accepting any developers also helps Sony a lot in getting a good amount of quality and expensive games, while Microsoft's parity clause was actually working against them in this regard. Overall though, today it's hard to complain. Sony has built up a robust library of absolutely killer exclusives that are hard for any gamer to pass up. And surprisingly, alongside Sony's Worldwide Studios, you've also seen a lot of second party exclusives in the last five years. And Sony also began offering premium PS2 games on the PlayStation Store. And I really wish they would focus their efforts on releasing more of those, because I really enjoy them having upscaled PS2 games with trophies, even if you have to pay for them and we were never offered software emulation backwards compatibility and we have to use streaming for PlayStation Now, at least let me buy more of those PS2 games. But you can't really complain on the front of PS4 exclusives and the amount of games that have been available. Games like Detroit Become Human, Horizon Zero Dawn, God of War, Spider-Man, Ratchet and Clank, Infamous, Little Big Planet, Uncharted 4, Until Dawn, Bloodborne, there's so many titles, I can't even rattle them off. That would be an entirely separate video to kind of focus on all of Sony's first party or second party titles, but there has been a lot and a lot of them have been very good. And even if you're the kind of gamer that's more particular, there's always one or two games in there that speaks to you. Now speaking about PlayStation Now, we can also discuss that because that is the service that Sony offers with PS2, PS3, and PS4 games for streaming. And this service has a huge library of games at an extremely good price no matter how you choose to spin it, but gamers are reluctant to stream their games and it's understandable. But now, Sony offers downloading the PS4 and the PS2 games, which may be a game changer for the service in the short term until its main purpose really takes off and it's widely adopted, and I think that's why Sony is still doubling down on keeping PlayStation Now around, especially given how I've discussed before why they don't do software emulation or system on a chip with PS4. We've already gone over it about why Sony doesn't do backwards compatibility natively, and it's usually because of liability and the fact that they just straight up can't with PS3 games. Which now brings us to Sony. How has the company's attitude shifted over the last five years and how they handled PS4 in general? And if you remember early on, they were actually very communicative and supportive. Sony Shuhei Yoshida on Twitter back when the PS4 launched really gained a lot of traction because he was responding to a lot of fan questions on Twitter and he would make humorous jokes and there was almost this good camaraderie going on between representative of a major multi-billion dollar company and the consumers and fans that enjoy the products. And Adam Boys was also great as his position of uh, vice president of third party relations. He kind of pioneered and helped the whole independent developer movement on PS4 up until he left for Iron Galaxy Studios. But the thing about the PS4's life cycle is that we actually saw major departures from key people that made the PS4 so great during those five years. So Sony Computer Entertainment America president and CEO Jack Trutton had left the company and he was replaced by Sean Layden. You saw Sony Interactive Entertainment President and CEO Andrew House leave the company, and he was replaced by John Kodera. And then you have Kaz Harai, Sony Corporation CEO, leave for Kenichiro Yoshida to take over. And this isn't necessarily bad news. All the replacements are still key guys that were there for the whole ride of Sony. They have long histories with the company, long histories with PlayStation. Sean Layden has already kind of, I think, earned his stripes in terms of PlayStation. He seems to be uh, a very good public speaker and really cheering for the fans. John Kodera and Kenichiro Yoshida we haven't seen a whole lot of, but again, they've had such a long history with the company. In theory, PlayStation is still in good hands, but that remains to be seen long term. You also saw the closure of two studios during the PS4's life cycle, which was Evolution Studios and Guerrilla Cambridge, both of which were poised to do more PS4 work before they were shut down. And then there was the crossplay controversy, which is that Sony did not allow PS4 games to be cross-network played with Xbox One players or Nintendo Switch players, and they do allow in certain circumstances and various titles to allow mobile players to join with PS4 players or PC players. It was strictly other competitor consoles like Microsoft and Nintendo, and Microsoft and Nintendo are open to this, Understandable to see why, because they don't have as many consoles out in the market, and Sony has market leadership. They want to keep people in the PS4 ecosystem, and I did not like this issue. A lot of PS4 fans were sympathetic with Sony's decision. I don't really agree with that. I think Sony should be open to it for the good of the consumer, and it wasn't necessarily a situation where it was totally business-oriented. Third-party developers wanted this as well, so it was quite upsetting to see so many games where they wanted to do something like this, and Sony kept saying no to, to games like Rocket League or Paladins, Minecraft, 
and now Sony has finally opened up the doors a little bit with Fortnite. So they are going to allow cross-network play with Xbox One, Switch, and all those other agnostic platforms like PC, iOS, Android, and that's great. Hopefully this will deepen a little further and Sony will allow more cross-network play to be widely available. I never liked their initial decision. I understand why they made the decision. I never thought it was good. They need to be more open and consumer friendly. We do not want to see a cocky Sony like 2006 where they think people go out and buy a $600 PS3 because they were the shit with PlayStation 2. Consumers can and will go to another platform if you try and treat them like that and think you can do whatever you want with them and force them into your ecosystem. I was never really a big fan of that decision, but if we're looking at the overall support of what Sony's done with PS4 over the last five years, and if we're grading on a curve based on the previous generation with PlayStation 3, they did exponentially better this time around. Which brings us nicely into the overall section. And well, the market's spoken. PS4 is the current console of choice and for good reason. Sony did a great job with PS4. The system isn't without issues, but they can be far and few between when looking at the bigger picture. Sony had a long-term game plan with PS4, and these five years proved it with the streaming, PS4 Pro, and virtual reality. The games have been great, and though the network is showing no huge signs of improvement, and there's major shifts in leadership, that could point to different decisions down the road, and we'll see how that all turns out, but that still remains to be seen. It's really hard to argue, but PlayStation 4, you're probably sitting around an A-, minus, maybe even a B+, plus, depending on gamer's taste, you know how some people are, and certainly emotionally charged people could be like, oh my god, PS4 sucks. B-. minus. It's doing good. You can't really fault them for it. Anyway. That's all I've got for you in this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't yet, subscribe for the best PlayStation news, reviews, and updates here on YouTube, and I will see you all in my next video. You take it easy.